You got to love yourself more than the need to be loved by other people. Because if you're waiting for everyone to tell you who you are, you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. If you're exhausted in this dating experience, maybe we take a step back and say, okay, what is it that I say that I want? And what am I receiving? Where's the disconnect? What's my responsibility here? Sabrina Zohar. Hey, girl. Welcome to After Curfew. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for I'm having me. ecstatic to have you. I know our audience is going to absolutely love this episode. How did you get started in relationship, dating, coaching? So my background's not the traditional. So I have a clothing line called Software, and I was pursuing that for five, six years, growing that. And in 2022, I started getting people reaching out to me because I'd be on other podcasts and panels like, hey, I'd love to like do life coaching or business, things like that. Like you were able to start it from nothing and scale it. So I was doing that just kind of on the side. And then I was supposed to do Shark Tank and was sent home from on set. Excuse me? Yeah, like I was on set, like ready, you're next, like get ready, Sabrina. And then as I'm walking to set, they stopped and they're like, we're so sorry. We actually ran out of time today. My whole world crumbled. Like this was six months of prepping for like the opportunity. And so I went home and like lost my shit. (laughs) They did that to me (laughs) twice, like within the month. And they kind of just like, sorry, try again next year. And I was like, just rock bottom. And at that point I was like broke. I didn't know what the fuck I was going to do. I was really miserable in my dating life in the sense where I felt, you know, New Yorker in LA and I felt really lost. And I felt like nobody was actually talking about things like, how do you genuinely help your anxiety? How do you actually date with intention? And it's just a lot of like buzzwords and if he wanted to, he would, but you're like, but can we go further? Can we understand the psychology? And so I took to TikTok and I was like, well, I might as well just create my own content and started posting in an Oct- October, 2022. Viral videos started to happen, started the podcast 23, January 23. And then like literally the rest is history. It just was very organic. I started becoming public about the coaching of like, yeah. And now I'm booked out like five, six weeks at a time. Podcast is growing exponentially. Um, and it's just, happened very organically, I think, because when you actually fill a hole in the market and you actually have something to say that people can resonate with, it feels a lot more community-based versus it just being another person saying what everybody else is saying on the Mm -hmm. internet. That's insane that you were going to be on Shark Tank and they let you go twice? Twice. I went literally bananas because it was, you think, you know, you put all of your hope into this being it, but like, a kind of a harsh reality for me, and it's not a good thing, but I do best under pressure. So I do too. What, I, what is that? Trauma. I don't know. <laughs> probably. Trauma, literally, probably. <laughs> it's more of that survival. You know, that real, like when, when COVID happened and I thought I was going to lose my clothing line, I started hand tie dyeing everything and turned it into a million dollar business. And so like then when I lost my dog, like this all, shark tank, everything happened, created the TikTok and the, part, the podcast then my career took off. So I think it's really when we get into those moments of like, I'm going to lose everything, that real fight or flight kicks in where it's like, I actually have to survive. So I need to become creative and start something new. And it happened so quickly. Like I posted on Instagram a year ago and now we're at 800,000 followers. It's like, how does this happen? Uh, I piss people off. You know that you're doing well when people don't like you. Oh, you have secret haters or just regular haters. Girl, you're doing all the right things. Dude. Yeah. But I think it was for me, like I was such an anxious girl. Dating was so tough for me. And I just, every time I'd go on the internet, you'd see like, just do this. And you're like, okay. So I did that. I still feel awful. I'm still struggling. My anxiety is overwhelming. I'm literally crippled. And so I had to take to what's going to help. How can I learn? And I started to dive into understanding psychology and the brain, how the nervous system works Mm -hmm. and how to actually implement things because dating and anxiety really do go hand in hand. I mean, anxiety is so much more linked to dating more than ever because of social media and just like how we go about like situationships and things like that. Like what would you advice would you give to somebody who does struggle with anxiety or the anxious attachment style? So many different places to start. I think really when it comes down to that anxious attachment style, like what a lot of anxious folks don't really understand. And that's okay because who's teaching us this is one, that's not fixed, right? Like you don't have to always be anxious. Like I have anxiety because I'm a human, Mm -hmm. but my anxiety in my relationships, it just doesn't exist anymore. Like I'm very secure. I'm very confident in who I am. And I move like that in my relationships. That's how I have the partner that I have. But I think for most people struggling, one thing that they need to understand is like, 
there's a misconception that anxious attachers are expressive and we at least say what we feel. We're not like the avoidant who shuts down. And it's mm -hmm. like, actually, you are equally as avoidant because the avoidant is actually equally as anxious. What it is, is when you're an anxious attacher, you're so focused externally. But what do you want? What are you saying? What do you like? What do you need? How can I make you happy? You're actually avoiding what's actually coming up for yourself. Ooh. So, there, and a lot of people are confused by that. And it's like, there's nothing wrong, but we are not actually going, wait, what's happening in my body? How do I feel? What's coming up for me? A question that I ask most people that have high anxiety is like, what is it that you want in a relationship? And the answers are usually all over the place and very rarely do they ever lead with like, I want someone who's empathetic and compassionate and thoughtful and listens to me because it's usually like, I want someone to do stuff with, or I just want someone that will call me or text me. And it's like, but that's not a relationship. That's just a shallow. And so I think being able to really express that of like, what is it that you really want and need? You really need to be in touch with yourself to be able to articulate what you'll actually need in a relationship. So that way you can identify that in a partner. Mm -hmm. So I think it starts there of just turning it inside. Every time you want to make it about someone else, stop yourself and be like, what's coming up for me? Where do I feel this? What's happening? Can I even just sit with it? Probably not, and that's okay, but try. And that's the way to start because anxiety is a fear of the future. And the problem is technology, all those things that we talked about, they mimic a nervous system dysregulation. So if we say, I didn't get a text from this guy for a day, we know it, heard all the time. <laughs> then all of a sudden your body is like, I'm not safe. I don't feel safe unless I have them. Well, there's no actual real threat there, right? You're safe because you have you, not because you have other people in your life. Mm -hmm. As a child, your parents, you're right. You're only safe if you have that parent there because who's gonna take care of you? The un problem is that our brain, when we go into neuroplasticity and like what's going on, we start to go into different parts of the brain, the limbic system and the amygdala. That stopped growing when you were six. So if somebody triggers you, you feel something, your brain goes right back to that's dad or that's mom, or that's something you experience Ooh. as a child, protect, you go into your protective mechanism. So then it's, can you just tell me everything's okay? Can you just text me? Can you quell my anxiety? Because I'm scared of what's gonna happen if I lose you. At the end of the day, it's not your parents. You get to make choices, you get to make decisions, and you get to empower yourself to show up as a different version of yourself and not wait for other people to choose you because you also are choosing yourself. Well, God damn, that was a mic drop. <laughs> How do we move to secure? How do we get past all that? Trauma and drama. <laughs> and like, I'll be very candid. Like I have more, more, I was more the anxious attacher and my partner was more avoidant. Like okay. he is, he shuts down. And it's like one common misconception that we have with avoidance is that like, they don't care. Oh, they just shut, they just remove themselves. It's like, no, 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 no. You know how the anxious person goes outwards and they go, oh my God, please validate. And I'm anxious. I need you to quell. They're doing that, but internally. Mm -hmm. Their biggest fear is rejection. So to them, it's like my sister, I'll give you an example. She's super avoidant. And she learned at a young age, you're going to get hit if you open your mouth. You're going to get punished. Your father is going to walk out. He's going to dismiss you. So she learned, put your emotions away. Don't have any. Mm. That's not realistic, but people might look at her and be like, she's so cold. And it's like, she's internally freaking out and she's having a complete meltdown, but she doesn't look it. That was a coping mechanism. Right. So when it comes to either insecure attachment, what we really need to start to look at is like, one, understanding, like for the avoidant, it's understanding what are the fears? What's coming up for me? Both people need to stop and go, wait, what's happening in my body? What is this lived experience? Because you're not going to feel better until you feel intellectualizing it and going over, I've read every podcast and I've read every book and I've listened to this and I've done that. Your brain is gonna intellectualize, but that's like me learning how to do surgery. But until I go to do surgery, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. So until you really start to feel it, like my partner and I, when I see him going in his head, the first thing I'll stop is I'll be like, babe, what's happening in there? Talk to me, are you okay? And I create that space for him and he's like, I'm struggling right now. And I'm like, it's okay, you don't need to talk, I'm just here. Whereas for me, as an anxious person, I want to tell you everything. I want to work on it. You want to yap for days. I'm the same way, yeah. So instead, what I have to do is when something happens, and instead of reacting, I'll stop. So like the avoidant person's job, if you will, in the healing journey, is to identify where they learned that it's not safe to express themselves. Where did they learn that? Parents, yada, yada, caregivers, whatever. And then to start to have that safety to be able to express yourself and not be scared of rejection. For the avoidant person, because we're so, or the anxious person, because we're so scared of abandonment and being left, what really the work starts with us is to put space between the reaction and the response. Mm. So for me, my partner, I'll give you an example. The other night I said, hey babe, can we, like, do you want to go do something next week? And he just turned and went, no. 
and walked off. And now, like, to any person, they'd be like, all right, well, you didn't want to do that. Yeah. For me, instantly, I got anxious and I got triggered. And then he stopped. And, like, I had to stop. And I was like, okay, well, what's happening for me? And I, I can do this in seconds. And I was like, this is in my chest. And then I was like, man, you know what this reminds me of? It feels like when dad used to do and walk off. And he was really dismissive of me. And so when my partner came back in the room and he was like, hey, are you okay? And I was like, no, can I be honest? I said, that was really triggering to me. You didn't do anything. Moving forward though, could you maybe say it like this? And I explained and he was like, man, that makes sense. Knowing your dad, I could see how that'd be really triggering for you. Absolutely. Thank you for telling me. Mm -hmm. You see how instead of it being, well, why don't you care about me and becoming about him? Well, you need to tell me this. Instead, I was able to validate myself and say, it's okay. That did hurt you. That reminded you of dad. There's a little girl in there that is really scared that this is going to be the same, but I'm here to let you know that I have your back and I'm going to protect you. And then I was able to come as a woman and speak to my partner about what the fuck is going on. It's really just about putting space so that we don't react because when you react, you come from a child. When you respond, you're able to take a second and come from the adult. Right. And I do think that is hard sometimes oh, with yeah. anxiety. You want to just blurt everything out like, oh my God, this is making me feel like this and all that. And it's like your brain is going a mile a minute, but mm -hmm. you really do need to take a step back and realize like, make it about yourself. Yeah. It's not about the other person because the other person really can't, shouldn't, like if you're solid, shouldn't rock you that hard. Right. So you really have to like learn how to be, I'm okay. Yeah. Fix it yourself. Well, it's like validate it. You know, like you really want to become secure. What, let me ask most people that are listening, when you were a kid and you were sad, did you have a parent that was like, hey, that's totally valid. You have every right to be sad. <laughs> okay. Express yourself. Talk to me. No. So then you learn, I'm too much. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? I, I, anything I do, this person's walking away from me. We create those core beliefs. Right. So instead, we have to really be able to combat that of like, well, instead of lashing out and waiting for you to validate me, I need to be able to say, whoa, Sabrina, it's okay that that hurt you. You're allowed to be upset and sad about it, but it also doesn't need to be their problem. Mm -hmm. You can say something to me that might piss me off. That doesn't mean I need to start coming at you and being like, you know, that was rude and blah, blah, blah. I get to make a decision and say, wow, she had no idea what she was saying to me. She did not understand that that triggered me. And I think we're just in this kind of generation now where like, there's this fear around any kind of bad, if you will, mm -hmm. negative emotion, right? Yeah. Just, I can't feel sad. I don't want to be triggered. The slightest thing, walk off, leave them. If anybody triggers you, don't stay. And it's like, so you just want to avoid? You just want to shut down? You just want to have, you don't get the good with the bad. Yeah. You, how do you appreciate this beautiful partner that you have unless you've had really shitty ones? Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't think I would have known with my partner now that it was, I don't think I would have been ready that's the better way to put it. I yeah. would not have been ready for a relationship like this if I did not go through the awful situationships, the like avoidance, yeah. like all that crap. Like you really do have to walk through the fire. So I have a, an online course. Yeah. And the first week, the first week, the first thing we talk about is let's talk about your patterns. It's mm. literally like, because if we don't call out to the surface, here's what I'm dating. Here are the people I'm getting. And here's what I claim I want. Where's the disconnect? And usually the disconnect, a lot of people want to say, oh, it's because they don't want to commit. And it's, oh, because it's, it's external, right? Well, they don't want that. And it's like, okay, let me ask you a question. How are you showing up? Mm. How are you showing up? Because if I'm showing up confidently saying, okay, well, I know myself, I know my triggers, I know my wounds, I know what it is, but you know what I also know? I know what I need. I know the support I like. I'm very in touch with that. Then when I see it, I'll be like, hey, this doesn't need to be a thing about me. I don't need to create a narrative here. You're just not for me, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm okay to walk off because... I saw a quote the other day that was like, just because you're thirsty doesn't mean you're going to take the poison. Oh. And it's like, just because you're single doesn't mean you take what's out there. You can still, like an example I kind of use is like, if you need a salary of 100K, mm -hmm. some of these guys or girls or theys, whoever they are, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever's listening, they're coming in at 40K. Okay, that's too much of a discrepancy. Your needs will never be met. And yeah. so then you're self-sabotage, you're self-abandoning, you're doing things for other people just to have them choose you. As opposed to, sorry, too much of a discrepancy. You don't want a relationship. You want to stay in this. You want to avoid what I'm talking about. You don't want to have these conversations. That doesn't work for me. Will they say, you're too much? Good, go find less. You're in. Right. It's just really understanding, like part of that healing process is validating and acknowledging, well, this is what I need and I'm going to stand in that power. I'm not too much for saying that I want a partner that communicates with me. What would you say to like the girls that really are just exhausted? It's okay to take a beat, you right, know? And I right. think at the end of the day, your mind is going to dictate. If you walked outside right now and said, I want a red car, all you'll see is a red car because we have a cognitive bias. Your brain is going to continue to show you the things that you believe. Mm. If you genuinely believe 
that you're never going to meet anyone, then that's the energy you're bringing in. So then when you come in, you're going to be skeptical of people. You're not going to trust people. You're going to wait for them to fuck you over. So then you're going to be on the defense always, always in the negative and always, well, fuck people and fuck this and da da da. (laughs) Instead of just because I haven't met them doesn't mean I won't. And we have to reframe of, I get it, it's exhausting. Then start, become a better buyer. You know, like start vetting people a little bit harder. Have FaceTime vibe checks instead of going out on this date. Go, what I did was I made them um, things that I was going to do. So, hey, I'm going to go to, there's a studio in in, um, Venice that I loved called Camp. And I'd be like, I'm going to go to yoga at Camp and then go to Erewhon because, of course, I needed to. Um, (laughs) little Erewhon run, $100 later. Not sponsored, but should be. Um, But like I would do that and I'd say, hey, why don't you meet me either for class or for a coffee after? I was going to go do it anyways. Mm. Then I wasn't as exhausted because if I went and we had a nice time, great. But if you're, you, if you are not happy with the life that you have, then waiting for someone to, they are an addition to, not instead of. So you have to, and it's okay if you're not there, but it has to be to the point where you in my life or you out of my life does not change how much I love my life. Good with, good without. Mm-hmm. And my mama has been saying this to me since I was a kid. You got to love yourself more than the need to be loved by other people. Because if you're waiting for everyone to tell you who you are, you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. If you're exhausted in this dating experience, maybe we take a step back and say, okay, what is it that I say that I want? And what am I receiving? Where's the disconnect? What's my responsibility here? I think a lot of times we don't think that we need to be fixed. Or we're like, we bring everything to the table, like the sprinkle, sprinkle, all that. (sighs) But you really do need to, like one of my first dates with my partner now, I said, I'm the prize. And he was like, bitch, like... Take a seat because like you need to bring things to the table as well. Like, and I think a lot of the dating mentality now is like, we like, I don't know. We're just kind of like, we should be sought after, but you have to work on yourself and you have to become the person that you want to date. Like if you want to date that type of person, like you need to start elevating yourself too. And I think there's like a weird disconnect. Oh, you mean the advice that's telling women pretty much how to be a high, like an escort? It's like very, <laughs> there's a lot of it's this. It's really controversial. It really is. It's very, and it's like, here's And the I thing. fell into the sprinkle, sprinkle world. I was all sprinkle, sprinkled for a minute. I was like, yes, I want to be shaking my ass in Miami on a yacht. But then I'm like, this is not going to help me long-term. It's, and it's one of those things like, cause people will be like, sparkle, sparkle, sprinkle, sprinkle, whatever, sparkle, whatever the sparkle. fuck it is. I don't even shit. It shows you how little I care about it. Oh my God. And it's like, and my question is always, how's your dating life? How's your life? Your ha- or when the texting thing. When I get people like, you don't know what you're talking about. If a guy doesn't text me every day, he doesn't like me. And I'm like, cool, how's your relationship? Mm. What is the depth of your relationships? So if you're hyper-focused on the fact that, that my, like if I listened to that advice, I wouldn't be with my partner. Yeah. I wouldn't because my partner set that from the beginning. He was like, listen, I'm not fucking 15, okay? I don't need to be chained to my phone. I'm living my life. I'm working full time. I have my dog. I have my life. I care about you. I want to see you again. I am not going to be texting you all the time. What is your take? I saw, okay, one of your previous TikToks was like the good morning text and we're going to get into that. But, because I have a fucking awful story about something like that. (laughs) Don't we all though? (laughs) Don't we all? But what would you say the appropriate amount to be texting? Because obviously like we grew up with technology. This is like the first era of people that are like, we started with like Came out of the womb. Yeah, like speed dial up, whatever that shit was. And then aim, yeah. texting all the time. A lot of people are like, oh, we text good morning and good night. I think that is so fucking unhealthy. It's so unhealthy. We make a date, we make a date. And I will talk to you either the day before or morning of. Correct. And I think we put too much emphasis and like, that's where the anxious actually does come in. Cause you're like waiting on a text. I would be like crippling anxiety when I used to like move like that. So, you know, that's the addiction loop. That's literally the addiction loop. Your brain is now addicted because what ends up happening is when we get so hyper-focused on the texting, it's a false sense of intimacy because text has no tone. Mm. So if you and I are texting, I'm creating the version of who I want you to be. Stop. Wait, that is so good. It's like that one Key and Peele skit when it's like, do you even want to go out? That's literally what it is. You are creating like this narrative. Creating an entire, and then not, and then we go to, to go further. Then their response is, we create, how would I answer me, right? Oh, I would say, ooh, yeah, girl, can't wait. But that girl <laughs> might've been like, yep, can't wait. You know what I mean? Like there's no intonality. And so I think what ends up happening is like, you create a false sense of intimacy. You get, so you think you're closer to this person than you are. You've created this version and then you show up and it's either you're gripping to hold on to that version of them. And then you're kind of like, what happened to them? And it's like, well, that, that was never them. Mm-hmm. Or you're no longer a fantasy and now you're in reality. I get this day in and day out. And I used to do it. We text every day and we had all these crazy conversations and he sent me good morning and good night. And then we had one or two dates and now I don't hear from him. It's like, cause you're real. Homeboy saw you. Mm-hmm. This person came and get, went, 
No, thank you. Right. Because you're allowed to. And so that's the thing. For me, the way I look at it is like, if you met somebody online and you're matching, have a little maybe hour conversation, right? Like get to know each other a little. Do you banter? Are you able to like, okay, cool, cool, cool. After that hour, one or both, it guess what, ladies? You can take control of your life and ask somebody out and say, hey, I'd love to grab a drink like or dinner or whatever you want to do. You want to go on a hike, want to walk. I don't give a shit. Just fucking meet this person. <laughs> And get out of the digital stuff. And then once you're there, then you get to decide first date just to see if you want to have a second date. Yeah. So like my partner, we chatted for about an hour. He said, hey, can I get your number? I'd like to take you out. Great. Mm -hmm. We made the plans. It was for right before Thanksgiving. We didn't talk for two days. I texted him being like, hey, I'm actually not feeling well. Can we reschedule to Saturday? He was like, absolutely. He was seeing his grandfather. He's like, I don't want to get anyone sick. We didn't talk for two more days. Friday, Saturday morning rolled around. I was like, hey, change of plans. I'll meet you here. Great. No worries. He was like, perfect. I asked him, I said, why didn't you text? And he was like, because we had plans. He was like, I was going to confirm with you morning of, but you text me first. And he was like, all right, you, you beat me to it. We went on our date. We hooked up. Thought I left going, never going to see this guy again. Fucked on the first date? We fucked on the first date. I love it. We went on That's a hike. Sick. Yes, Sabrina. And he told me he had a big dick. And I was like, let's find out. <laughs> and he did. And been truthfully, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't into him. I was not into, and I've told him this, like he's, there's a, he was there for the dick. I was there and for the dick. Sometimes, I, the guy, we are. The guy I was dating prior had erectile dysfunction, so I hadn't gotten laid in like three months. And I was going through, my dog had passed away, Shark Tank, all that. Wait, and I was like, did you know that prior to no. dating him? I found it was out. like a sneaky little mm -hmm. surprise. It was a like, or not a surprise, actually. First couple of times you're like, oh, it's fine, maybe he's nervous. And then it will, and then it progressed, and you're like, oh, no, you have a problem. And then he didn't want to talk about it, and he thought it was me, and it was like, okay, we're done here. Yeah. So when I met my partner and we went out, the first thing I thought, I was like, Ugh. I had like my ics. I was like, his clothes are too tight. I hate his car color. Just stupid shit. What was it? Like red? Yeah, it was blue. It's like one Ugh. of the electric blues. I'm sorry. There's certain car colors that so are just ugly. red, like the mm. maroony red. I'm sorry. I didn't see your car. Right. You no, I have a, a powder blue. Don't worry. I'm like, okay. I got the cute color. Like the, a gray. The, the blue as well. <sighs> that like cobalt blue. Yeah, yeah. I knew exactly what you meant. And so the minute I saw it and like he was like, he's 6'5", 250 pounds and he was wearing a size large. And I'm like, babe, you're not. You're an extra large. Like we need to get with it. Yeah. But like um, upon an initial like first date, I was like, not into this guy. And so when we went back, he was like, do you want to go to dinner? I said, okay, you know what? Make him a try, right? He's a nice guy. He listens to me. I don't shut the fuck up. Fine. And so when we went, he was like, let's let's come back to my house really quickly. Let me drop off the dog because you brought his dog. And he's like, I'll change quick. We'll go out to dinner. Okay. And when I saw him change, I was like, oh, he's cuter, like in these clothes. And then I like laid on his bed and he's like, I knew what you were doing. And I was like, I just needed to get laid. And then when he kissed me, it was so passionate. And I was like, whoa, who is this? Like, mm. that wasn't this guy. We hooked up. We went to dinner. And I remember he dropped me off like at the car and then I went home and didn't hear from him. And I was like, ah. Next morning I make a video and I was like, I met this tech guy last night. I'm probably never going to see him again. And then he texts me a few hours later and he was like, I'm still smiling from last night. Can I see you again? And I was like, sure. Then made plans, didn't see, didn't talk to him for a couple of days. And then he confirmed. And it was very just every date. I'd be like, well, if I don't see him again, this was fun because I surrendered and I released control of the outcome. Yes. I wasn't worried about him choosing me because I chose myself. If you don't choose me, don't worry, baby. There's plenty of other people that will. Mm -hmm. And here we are, a year and a half later, looking at rings and moved in together. And now it's like, it's very much a real relationship because I pushed past the, well, he doesn't do this and he doesn't do this. And it's like, you know what he does though? So many other amazing things. Mm -hmm. Sure, he doesn't splurge on dinners for me, but he cooks me dinner every fucking night and has lunch prepped for me in the morning. Oh, I'll take that any day over some guy that's like, you know, trying to show off and peacock to try to take me out to dinner. Yeah. Love bombing is a real fucking thing. Ooh. So anyways, to answer your question, yes, a very yes, long winded, yes. I think what's appropriate is a little bit of banter conversation to plan the date. You do not need to talk to somebody every day. Here's the reality. If me not talking to you, means that you forgot our date. Good riddance. Get the fuck out of my face. I don't need to remind you I exist. I know I exist. I take up this space. If you do not, I am this. I am hiring for the CEO of my company. Mm -hmm. I need to make sure I vet you. It's not the other way around. So I'm walking in saying, do I choose you? Not do you choose me? I don't care if you choose me. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not you. Yeah. So it's really about taking away the digital and setting a boundary. Hey, I'm excited for our date. I really don't want to get involved in too much of the texting. I would rather just get to know you in person. I dated a lot of people that were avoidance. And I'm anxious and they just go hand in hand until mm. they realize how fucking Skip awful it's off into the sunset. Yeah, I was like, yeah, nah, nah. yeah. But I would never be in relationships where like a man would ask me a lot of questions. And so I never really see what I mean by the anxious is also avoided. Where yes. we, we avoid to look and be like, oh, that's true. I haven't stopped to be like, does this work for me? Do <laughs> I like, like this? All right. Yeah. Cause then somebody asks you, you're like, oh, okay. My partner now would always be like, okay. And like, I don't accept the answer. So like, tell me more. 
And I'm like, that. what the fuck is this? <laughs> like, I have to really work. But like, it is, yeah, you gotta like really go deeper. There should be no fear on a first date. What, do you, what the fuck do you have to lose? Oh, wait, wait. What is like the biggest red flag you would say like in the early stages of dating or like on a first date the co constant texting and communication like that is just really not healthy and mm -hmm. it's coming from a place of insecurity too much future planning the like one of my clients now she's like we had a first date and the guy well first of all the guy brought her like a bouquet of roses and I was like you don't know this person though why did he bring you this elaborate gift when you start at 100 where else are you gonna go when they're giving you too much, they're giving you, mm. when they're too sweet, they're causing a toothache, right? When somebody is already, like one of my clients messaged me this morning and she's like, we had a great second date. He wants me to go away with him and meet his friends. And I was like, too much. You don't know this person. You are chasing a feeling. You are not genuinely getting to know this person because you could go away and then he could say after he's not into you. And now all of a sudden you're devastated and you're mm -hmm. confused. So what we really need to look for is one, how do they talk about their ex? How do they talk about their ex? I have no problem saying my ex is a raging piece of shit, but what I also will follow up with is, so was I. You know what I mean? Like I will take mm. full accountability that I was also an unhealthy person and that we both triggered each other, but I will still, you know, I wish him all the best, like move on with your life. You were not good to me, but I allowed it. Yeah. How someone speaks about their ex, how somebody, do they, are they willing to have conversations? Like if you ask a question, like how'd your last relationship end and what did it teach you about yourself? That sounds like it came out of, we're not really strangers. Right. I want to know what's the depth. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, did you take any, do you take accountability? Do you take ownership? Do you have any self-awareness? Did you do any work on yourself after this to start to understand your part in this? Things like that are huge. And also, can you say no to this person? Mm. Can you say no? Huge narcissist 101. They don't like you saying no. They don't want you to set a boundary. They don't want you to say, because they're in control. Mm -hmm. So do you feel comfortable? Do you feel seen, heard, and understood? If not, red flag. Yeah. I'm sorry. And I know that a lot of people want those like little minute ones. And I'm like, I'm not playing detective because the reality is what's a red flag for you might not be for me, mm. but what is our personality traits and how someone treats, how do they treat waiters? If anybody is rude to a waiter, I don't even entertain this. You Goodbye. Ever a I worked in retail. So I feel like everybody in their life needs to experience retail or they need to experience serving in a restaurant because it will humble you. It will teach you life skills and it will teach you communication and yes, that is such a big red flag. If somebody's fucking rude to a server on a date, like fuck off. Fuck off. It, Awful. I, I won't even entertain it. No. Anybody that's rude to anybody, I oh, am yeah, overly <laughs> nice to like wait staff, but especially people that cannot do something for you mm. that you deem are, oh, well, they're a wait. And it's like, no, they're a human and they're working a job that's doing something for me right now. Right. So just little things like that. And especially like the accountability thing is huge. You know, like if you go to like, I went to my partner in the beginning and said like, Hey, this really bothered me. And he was just like, wow. Okay. Like talk to me more, getting curious, having a curiosity, asking questions, probing deeper versus defensiveness or here she goes again, being fucking insane or gosh, she's so goddamn dramatic. It's like, that's dismissive and mm -hmm. that's avoidance. That's yeah. because that person doesn't want to take accountability. I think we place a lot of importance on these like little gems that are hidden. Like, oh, they viewed my story, but like I haven't talked to them in a week. What significance would you say social media plays? Like, like things like that. That's the same equivalent to someone looking at you on the street and keep walking because it's like, okay, they viewed it, but they didn't do it. There, there was no action. It mm. takes me seconds to go and then people, well, he was the first to view. And it's like, yeah, maybe he was on his phone at that time. Like it doesn't, unless somebody reaches out to you mm -hmm. because we have to remember, People, especially men, are visual creatures. They are significantly more visual. So like I had one of my clients who a guy only reached out to her when you would see her on Bumble. And I was like, dude, notice how he only reaches out when he gets a reminder of you, but yet he's so all over the place that he's not actually reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if social media has it's really fucking relationships because- It really does. It actually worries me when people write into me of like, and I look at their follower count and I'm like, yo. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I preach that as like what you should do. You don't think you should? No. What? That's hyper. Nah. That's anxiety. That's hyper vigilance. You're looking for a problem. Okay, You're literally. Yeah, but we already scanning. know I'm anxiety. All right. Well, I yeah. Have high functioning anxiety. Okay. You don't think that people should do their research? Not to me, that's research. I per, so for me, I don't give a shit who my my partner follows because that's on him. Okay. But what I have an issue with is the people that constantly check the follower list daily to be like you're following new women, and it's like, okay. Outside of the binaries, men and women. So how many options do you really have, right? Like mm -hmm. if I'm going to have somebody, of course, listen, if someone's following a shit ton of OnlyFans models. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but that. the thing is, 
you'll see that in their personality as well. You know what I mean? Like you're going to see that this person might not be commitment oriented or they're very all over the place or they're not really having conversations because they're visual and they just want that visual stimulation. But at the end of the day, we're allowed to watch porn, right? You can have your fantasies and it's like, well, but that's kind of the same thing. You're allowed to look and have that moment. Like I have a lot of good looking guys on my feed and I'm like, that guy's a babe and I keep scrolling because it's not like I'm doing anything about it. I'm not acting on it. It's the same as if I want to go and rub one out by myself and I'm going to watch a porn. It's like- <laughs> Rub one out. You know what I mean? But like, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not doing anything to my partner that's- Right, right, right. It's not detrimental it. to your partner. Right. But I think my issue with the social media is that hypervigilance of constantly checking. Mm. Listen, of course, you want to scan and look at the followers. Like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. But I'm talking of like, people write in like, I look today and he followed two new people. And it's like, hey- that's literal hypervigilance. That is you scanning the room because you feel unsafe and you're looking for things to reaffirm that you are not safe. But at the end of the day, maybe that's a cousin. Maybe that's a friend. Maybe that's a, you know what I mean? I don't think Melissa from Miami with like a BBL is a cousin. Might not be. But at the end of the day, she might, or she could be like a networking opportunity. Like one of my clients, her her partner's a photographer. So like he literally will follow, but he, and she's seen his messages. He's never inappropriate. He's very professional, but it's like, yeah, he likes all those girls. Like one of my good friends is a a really big photographer. He likes all of those girls because he's like, I have to. Like I work with them, I network, Mm -hmm. but he's not sleeping with them. He's not. And that's where it becomes. So here's my thing. Prior to healing, it's very black and white. Healing creates shades of gray. And so the reality is if you look and you're like, he liked all those photos, but where's the gray of, oh, right. Yeah, actually he's a photographer. So that would make sense that he would be liking these because it's a professional thing. And at the end of the day, he's coming home to me. Mm. If you don't trust your partner, then first of all, why are you with them? Second of all, why are you with them? Third of all, you need to work on whatever those issues are if they haven't done anything to cause you to not trust them. Because when someone doesn't, if you are like, I don't trust anybody, it's like, nah, it's not cute anymore. Go get help. Because if you don't trust other people, what you're saying is you don't trust yourself. That I don't trust that no matter what, I'll be okay. And I don't trust that I'll be able to see if you're bullshitting me. Yeah. Maybe will you? I don't know. Could my partner cheat on me? Sure. Anybody could. I won't take it. I won't own that, but I'm also not going to play detective to try to find him in that because I trust me and I trust our relationship. And if I'm with him, it's because I trust him. Mm. Yeah. That's my only thing with the social media. I know what you mean. Look at the list, but that hypervigilance of constantly checking or we, I haven't heard from him in a day. So I went and checked his following. It's like, (laughs) you're, because what happens is you create narratives. Yeah. You create narratives of, oh, and I knew it. And then you start to act different because then when they text you, you're like, hey. And it's like, yeah. dude, nothing happened. Like this guy, maybe, you've just, and you, oh, I'm so sorry. I was in work all day and I didn't get a chance to contact you. Sure. Okay. And it's like, now you're acting different because <laughs> you saw one girl like a photo and you created this entire narrative and none yeah. of that has any validity. Yeah. Where are the facts to back it up? If you have those feelings, they're probably not moving in a correct way. So like, you, I guess you really don't have to go do exactly. your research. I mean, I'm... I always did the research, and for, <laughs> it's like, but but it was because I knew that exactly. these people were not going to meet my expectations. That it's like the texting. That's the least of your issues. And if so, when people focus on that, it's like that's the, um, the that's the symptom. But mm-hmm. we have to look at the root cause, right? Yeah. And like you said, so you were going and you were looking at that. Your gut knew there was other things. Your gut knew they're not committing to me. They're not willing to have conversations like this. They're not posting me online. They're not taking me out and calling me their girlfriend. Mm-hmm. So when we look at that, sure, that's reaffirming belief. See, I know there's something here. It's like, girl, there is 30 other points of data that we can go on besides that to show that this person's not for you. I, why is that so fucking hard? <laughs> like so, when you so, see things that aren't aligned with you, like why does it take so long and why do we need to keep so searching like I'm somebody I needed to keep searching 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 and then I'm like okay I finally had enough it's like I put myself I like somehow love the fucking torture well it depends on how you grew up so like for me yeah. I would do that because my core belief was I'm not good enough I'm too much but I'm not good enough that fun little dichotomy yeah um and so I was always I need to prove myself I need to earn it I need to get it because that's how I was with my dad mm-hmm. you had to get his attention you had to earn it he would walk out on you he was dismissive he was incredibly narcissistic it was always about him so I was that little girl inside of me learned this is how I survive this is my first relationship. So then when I'm dating and when you're going through that, it's the addiction loop. Your brain knows familiarity. Your brain can go from feeling to fucked like that. Mm-hmm. And it goes into shortcuts. So right now your brain knew, yo, she's way too overwhelmed. She's feeling too much. Shut down. Go mm-hmm. right into protective mechanisms. That's familiar. You know how to move like that. Right, you right. know what you don't know how to do is stand up for yourself and say, this doesn't fucking work for me. May have never done that. Because what would have happened as a, as a child if you did that? you would literally may not have survived. Yeah. So now it's about understanding, wait a minute, I need to reparent that little inner child to know. And like what I like to do is um, 
I always recommend like put space. So like if I know, so I'll give you an example. One of my clients, she is dating this guy new mm-hmm. and she went, she was starting to sleuth and she was like, and I found this and I found this no stories to back it up. And I'm like, okay, but none of this is anything. Like it's a photo from a year ago. And it's like, what do you want me to do with this? Like, there's nothing here. Yeah. And so what I asked her was, I need you to tell me a favor. What happens between you feel unsafe and you grab your phone? That's the space we need to look at. Because in that space is where it's gonna tell us what's the trigger and what's actually happening for me. Because the symptoms are, so like for me, when I had a troll that would attack me, the first thing I would do is grab my phone and look at my follower count. So when I started to understand, like, huh, why do I do that? Because I felt unsafe. You don't like me. So I would go, oh, validation. Okay, I'm still okay. Instead now, when a troll or something happens and I get that dysregulation, instead of grabbing my phone, I'm like, whoa, okay, where is this in my body? Whoa, okay. I feel like I'm 12 again, sitting at middle school at the table with the girls that did not pick me. Mm. Okay, I got this. I'll journal. I'll go for a walk. I'll do that. The last thing I'll do is grab my phone. Because we have to learn tools to implement in these moments when you're feeling it. There is no, let me preface, no one is broken. There's nothing to fix. We just need to heal through the issues and the way, who taught you this? Yeah. That's it. We just need to address who taught you this so that you can actually come from a place of an adult and have a beautiful relationship and not from a place of a child waiting for someone to come save you. We're going to go to tech guy. I love that you call him (laughs) tech guy. Do you, is it like on purpose? Like you don't want people to know? Incognito? At beginning, now he's part of like he's like does stuff with me, and so we're oh, like his okay, name okay. is Ryan. But for Ryan. a year, it was tech guy because he was like, I don't want anyone to know who I am. Wait, I'm I like, love okay. that. So I respected his anonymity, and then he eventually was like, Fine. It's so funny. Like whenever you are talking to a guy, like girls will always put nicknames to always. guys. Like I'll have like the Miami guy yeah. or like yeah sandwich guy. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, like the fitness guy or <laughs> fitness the six guy. pack or like the motorcycle guy. It's like you have a nickname. He was tech guy because I didn't know what he did. He told me he worked. At, he was tech guy, and I was like. Do we know now? Project Still management. Don't oh, he works for me now. Oh, so, period. <laughs> yeah, he does all the tech. That's the funny thing. Wait, he does all that. the tech for the company. That's but amazing. It when I like when we even him, I literally left and I was like, I'm never going to see this guy again. That's where this whole thing started was because I was mm-hmm. like, I went out with this tech guy. I want to give him his privacy, and I was like, Ah, we'll see. Maybe I'll see him again. Maybe I won't. Yeah. Because you have to. There were so many times I would meet somebody and create a castle in the sky. And you, and you know what I mean? You go home and you're like, oh my God. You know, you don't mean to, but you're like, oh, but our kids. And oh my God, we could get married. Oh my God, they went traveling <laughs> Looking here. Looking at the Zodiacs. And like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. like, oh, well, he went traveling here. I want to go there. Maybe he'd want to go back. And you just start to create these narratives of mm-hmm. how much better your life is going to be with this person. Right. And when I met Ryan, I was just trying to focus on how much better can I make my life with just me? So when he was in addition to, not instead of, he was in addition to my life. He helped me grow. He created a safe space for me to express myself. Mm -hmm. He takes feedback. He asked me, please call me out on my shit. Like, how am I supposed to know if you don't tell me? Yeah. And so with that though, I was able to challenge my thoughts, sit in the discomfort of like, that's the hardest thing for people with anxiety. The feeling is overwhelming. Again, when we go into the amygdala and we talk about the brain, your amygdala stopped growing when you were six. Your prefrontal cortex at the front of your brain stops growing at 28. The prefrontal cortex is decision-making and common sense. We want to be in that more often than not. When we go back here into that limbic system, your brain knows she felt this when she was a kid. That's it. Yeah. It's it. And so it's like, protect her, save her because your brain energy saver, shortcuts. She's felt this before this um, abandonment, it's her father. And so with him, I was able to stop and be like, okay, can I challenge this? How can I show up differently? I could tell you right now, if I didn't do that, we would never be together. If I had pulled my anxious bullshit of the texting and the, the vibe is off. I don't understand. What vibe? I haven't seen you in 24 hours. What vibe is off? Just awareness too. Did you feel like, oh, this is different? Like I need to do better because he's bringing a certain like level of energy or were you going into it? Like for me, I'll date a while and then I step out of the dating scene. I'll reevaluate. Like I can't, like I'm not like one of those people that are constantly yeah. date, 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 date. I don't know how the fuck people do that. It's mentally, it's like an Olympic sport. Like month dating. off, month on. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So like when I got back into it, I was like, this is a practice and test for me. I'm not going to be texting. I'm mm-hmm. not going to be like very low. Like I'm not putting any emphasis on like, this is amazing. I'm writing our names in cursive together. All right. Like all of that. The hearts. Yeah, like. If people knew, like, you have to fucking prep yourself. The way you're prepping for war, like, okay, maybe not war, but, like, something like... The way you're prepping for anything. The way you prep for a... a, a, Doomsday, whatever. Or, like, a fucking final. Or you're going to work. Yeah. So, I prior... So, I really changed the way I dated earlier in the year 
that same year, um, my father and I had a falling out and I finally told him to fuck off. I was done. I just said, I was like, I'm done. And to me, I stood up to the big bad wolf. This is the person that caused all of this. Mm -hmm. And I finally stood up to him. So then what am I so scared of? And so I started to date with significantly more intention. I'd set boundaries. I would say, no, this doesn't work for me. I don't like that. Get out of my house. Like this isn't, I'm not cool with that. And then by the time I got the guy I was dating with the erectile dysfunction, he had done all the, he texts me every day. We had cute little nicknames on our phone. Mm -hmm. We were spending. What was his nickname? Squirtle. Classic? Like. I know, seriously. Um, it was like a stupid fucking Pokemon reference, which should have been the red flag. <laughs> that but, is a red flag. Right. Yeah. Um, but even that, so like we started with like the texting every day and he, we were seeing each other all the time. And he met my friends and family after two weeks and we went away. Here's the reality. When Clem died, my dog, he was nowhere to be seen. When I needed him, where was he? So what are these texts doing for me? And so that's, it like hit me at that moment where I was like, this doesn't mean shit. Mm. And every time I try to have conversations with him, he was super avoidant. He would just be like, yeah, everything's good. And I was like, eh, but it's not. So when I broke off with that, I met Ryan four days later. Cause I was, I, I only did with this guy for like two months. Okay. So it was one of those like, get out of here. Like I'm done. And Clem had passed and I used Hinge passively. I was like, I am not approaching people. I'm just whoever messages me. Right. Ryan wrote me a really beautiful thing. And the first thing I noticed was I haven't seen a guy like this in a while. I okay. haven't seen a man put this much effort into a it's message. It's always like, hey, hottie. Exactly. Hey, cutie. Hey, that smile. Look at those legs. And you're like, Lowest ah. fucking effort. Shut up. Red flag. You talk about my appearance at all in the first message. You're not getting a Your message. Your eyes are so beautiful. It's like, Shut That up. hair, I'd love to see if I can grab it. Oh! Get fucked. Literally go get fucked somewhere else. Truly. So with him, the first thing I noticed, I was like, this is different. And that was it. When I was with him, I was like, this guy's different. Yeah. Not in a like, this is my soulmate. I was just like, I haven't met somebody like this. And Interesting, I, intrigued. Exactly. Yeah. And when I asked him the same, he was like, same thing. I, when I said, I was like, what made you go for me? And he was like, the minute I met you, and he was like, as you were talking, he was like, I knew you weren't like the women. He was like, I was tired of the same conversations and all that. And my partner said one thing to me on the date that I will never forget. Mm. I don't want to fit into your life and I don't want you to fit into mine. I want to create one together. And I had never heard that because most people just fit into mine, just come into my life. Mm -hmm. And we have co-created together. We have now really everything we do is very teamwork. Hey, do you like this for the living room? No, then let's find something else. Yeah. We are very, we make decisions together. We make big choices together because we've allowed each other to have that space to be able to be open and honest. And what really did it for me was when I expressed myself to him and he was like, wow, thank you for and like ex created that space. I called my mom and I was like, I don't think I'm letting this go. Even though I was going to break up with him. Yeah. I had the text well, ready. What made you? Yeah. Cause you said you were going to end it. I was going to end it, but it sounds so great. I wasn't ready to receive that. You fall into these shit situations because you really don't love yourself. And sure. until you do, and you come as a whole person, 100%, you're not going to find. No, because I, I wasn't guy. ready to receive it. Yeah. Because of him telling me, I think you're amazing. Nah, no, nah, you don't. Whatever. Like that went against my core belief. That's why most people will be like, why do I like the guy that doesn't want, you know, the guy that likes me does, I don't want anything with him. It's like, because that goes against your core belief. Because if you genuinely believe, do you believe you're lovable? Do you genuinely believe that the parts of you that you hate someone else can love? Because if you don't, how the fuck do you want anyone to? Mm -hmm. So if I am so nervous about my anxiety, how is my partner ever going to support me if I don't actually own that? Yeah, okay, I have anxiety. You know, I'm an anxious <laughs> person. That's nothing new. You Have you met me? Yeah. So it's like, it's just about also owning those things and showing up. I first date, asked him about politics, religion, race, all oh, the Oh, you do it all. I did it all because- I feel like so many, okay. Why so waste my time? people are so against that. Like you can't bring up like, do you want children? Do you want this? Like wait a couple of days. I'm like, cause like catch a vibe first. Uh-uh. No, girl. I'm what? the same way. I'm like, do you want kids? like religion stuff, like, of course, like if you the, have to know these things. Anybody that's going to tell me to catch a vibe first, my thoughts are, you're not ready for a relationship then. Ooh. You're not, you're not ready for a relationship because it's not, you're going, you're chasing a feeling. I want to see how I feel. That's fleeting. You're not going to feel like that forever. Sparks, Harvard study, sparks are just your cortisol rising and your dopamine dropping. That's it. Yeah. It's just a stress response because your body is depleting itself of neurotransmitters and you're, <gasps> you're so excited about this person. It doesn't actually mean that there's anything compatible here. Mm. And so we have to be able to assess and address like, wait a minute, I actually want to know, are you going to waste more of my time? Because if I ask you questions of depth and you don't respond to me with depth, great. I don't need to waste my time past this first date. But yet when my partner did, I asked him to this day and he was like, the questions you asked, he was like, no one had ever asked me those questions. And the minute you did, he was like, I knew you had a depth to you. Yeah. That's what I wanted. Show up as the partner you want. Right. 
And I have that. I have a super deep, emotional, vulnerable, transparent man because I showed up as that and I showed him it's safe. You can do that with me and I don't judge you. Versus I'm just going to play the cool girl. It's like, don't worry. Ooh, the cool girl is tired. She's, it's like the away. nice guy. Put her away. The nice guy, cool girl, awful. They don't be, and the reason they're not sustainable is because you don't have a backbone. Right. Have a fucking opinion. Tell me no. Right. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you don't. But t- tell me you don't want to do that. But if you do everything for me, yeah, you're people pleasing me. You're boring. You're one note. Mm-hmm. There's no depth to you. There's no full picture. Right. It's real old real quick. Yeah. How would you shift the cool girl? Like say if somebody is in that era, because I know I've been the cool girl before where Same. I, it's hard to get rid of because you're so used to being like, yeah, I don't want them to not talk to me anymore. So I guess this is fine. Even though I don't want to like, we're going to Indian and I don't want to eat Indian food tonight. Like people pleasing, like how, what would be like your number one thing to step away from that? So a, th- a therapist, I love Matthias Barker has always said people pleasing. You have to start to look at, am I being hurtful or am I being harmful? I can hurt your feelings, mm-hmm. but I don't want to harm you. And okay. I also don't want to harm myself. So I don't want to go to Indian food. Okay, well, it gives me a fucking stomach ache and it makes me nauseous. I'm harming <laughs> myself if I keep I'm literally going to be in the bathroom blowing it up. So exactly. Yeah. Versus I hurt your feelings because you really wanted Indian and I don't. Okay, well, I can accept hurting your feelings. Okay. And so we really have to look one, where did you learn that? Like my sister the other day, she was like, you know, Joe taught me that, my brother. And I was like, did he? And she was like, hey, he told me play cool because guys don't like emotions. And so that's where she learned it from. Harmful information. Correct. But because my brother had to put his emotions away in order to have a relationship with my father. It's all cyclical. It makes yeah. sense. So for me, I was a, I was the cool girl. I was, I have no needs. What are you talking about? I, don't, I am good. No, she <laughs> did. She has needs. She has wants. She has desires. She's mm-hmm. not just a plant. I don't just need water and sun. I need a lot more than that. Yeah. You have to own that. Right. You have to own and say, I can take up space. I'm allowed. I'm not a child anymore. My parents are not going to tell me I'm too much. I am allowed to take it up. And it might feel really uncomfortable, but that's what we have to push through that discomfort of, yeah. does my, do my needs matter or do yours matter? Right. I got to put the oxygen mask on myself first before I help other people. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. We're going to play Never Have I Ever. No. <laughs> They won't, it's not like anything too juicy, but. Okay. <laughs> okay. Never have I ever created a fake profile to stalk someone. Do I raise my hand if I haven't? You could just say I have or, or I haven't. I'm not going to make you work. I have. Okay. You have? Once. No, no, no. I lied. I used my friends. I okay. used my friends. She already had one and it was a guy who ghosted me. And I was just kind of like, is he alive? So I would use her profile to go on and like kind of see. And then like I would go and go. And then finally one day he went on and he messaged her. And he was like, oh, you're becoming quite a regular around my, it was when okay Cupid when you could see who would look at your profile. And I was like, oh, so he's alive. And this girl was like ratchet. We made her like the worst profile. Oh, wait, wait, wait. (laughs) So it was a fake profile on okay Cupid. Yeah. And you would go to his... How, how does OkCupid okay work? I've never been on it. As if many moons ago. It was like one of the first. Yeah, yeah. It would be like, like, I don't think OkCupid okay is what it used to be. No, it was like a desktop thing. So like it would have it and it would show you who viewed your profile. So it would show you every don't time. You love that? Like I love, I'm sure you what don't have it on with TikTok. I'm like, I love to oh. see who's looking. I yeah, love like, to see the hey. like Hey. Um, yeah. And so she already had, she thought her boyfriend was cheating. So she had created this whole profile with this girl and made her super slutty and like awful. And just like, so when I was like kind of freaking, I was like, I haven't heard from this guy. Like he stood me up for dinner. It was like after two months of dating, like we had been seeing each other. We had plans that night and two two months months of like seeing each other two to three times a week. He came to my house like that week being like, I was supposed to move for a job and I'm going to stay. I want to be with you. And I was like, okay, like, cool. Sure. I didn't like, I was 22. I didn't know or 21, I was like, what is ghosting? You know what I mean? Yeah. And we, that, that night I saw him that morning. He was like, oh baby, I can't wait. I'll see you tonight. Give him a big kiss. And I was like, yeah, you can't wait. We're going to a true blood party. It was like a premiere, I'm fucking aging myself. And um, <laughs> then I went to dinner and I was like, texting him like, hey, I'm on my way. Like, I'll see you there. Never to be heard from wait, again. Wait, 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 wait. He ghosted you on the way to the date. Like never heard from him again. Exactly. Like he was supposed to meet me. Like he stood me up and ghosted me. And then I saw, he lived in my neighborhood in East Village in New York. So I was like, why would you do that? I saw him like a couple of weeks later on the street and I just flicked him off and I got a text like it was cowardice. I owed you an explanation. Never got that to this day. No idea what happened, but that's the only reason I ever looked. Cause I was like, is he alive? Like, oh, I would be so confused. And then when he messaged her, I was like, oh, you're alive and well. So you're just a douchebag. Yeah. So that what was the, the only f- time. But other than that, I've never like made a fake profile. I makes me feel icky. Me and my one friend, she well, she had a Finsta. And then yeah. we both were logged into the Finsta and she's yeah. like, let's give her a personality. I'm like, you know what, bitch, let's do it. <laughs> Sparkle it on. She was like this horse girl. Of course. From the South. Yeah. And I mean, we collected the information we needed. If I were you, oh my God, I would have freaked out. I, I didn't know, like, 
this was literally the first time that had ever happened to me. And I was like, yeah. I don't understand. I'm like, but what? And this was 2009. So it's like, this wasn't like, I had just gotten an iPhone. It was when iPhones became like, you know, sign up for AT&T and get it for mm-hmm. 199. You're like, fuck yeah, it's accessible. Yeah. So we didn't have, like, it wasn't big on texting. There was, this was the first online dating I'd ever done. I met him on the app. All of it was new. I had never experienced that before. Where like you would could date somebody and like, I'm talking like 20, 30 dates. Like this wasn't just once or twice. We were seeing each other all the time, hooking up, like meeting friends. This was like, we were going into our third month of dating and it was like, you could have just told me. What? Yeah, and he was 10 years older than me too. I was like, oh, I was. No, it's always the older men that don't know how to communicate. That's why they're single. Cause that's why they're single. Yeah, exactly that. It Don't you think it is? Like there is something about like, Especially when they're going for the younger. Mm, that's that's it. Usually, like, when my partner, when I met Ryan, he was 30, he's 38 this year in, like, two weeks. Um, but, like, when I met him, he, like, he had relationships. He was just like, I'm just looking for something specific. Versus when you see things like that and you're like, oh, you just don't know how to communicate like an adult. And, mm. ah, ha, ha. Because usually when people ghost, and that's why, like, I think ghosting got hijacked. Because so many people will be like, I got ghosted. And I'm like, go on. Well, we went on a first date and he never contacted. I'm like, that's not ghosting. That person just did not want to see you again. Okay, but you think that's acceptable? I think it's acceptable if you didn't have, if it was just a first date and you both left being like, all right, well, thanks so much. Nice to have met you. I don't think both people have to be like, hey, by the way, I don't want to see you again. When you date in a major city and you've got seven dates that week, you're not going to be texting every- it happens where you're just like, I'm not going to see you again. If I don't call you again, I don't call you again. Above that, I think it's fucked. But I think on a first date, that's why I'm like, stop with the texting. Go and yeah. see if you like this person. But when I get people, he ghosted me and like, we were texting, like, you did not know this person. You literally never met them. They might not have even been real. So that's why I'm like ghosting to people that are like, no, I was dating this person and they never contacted me again. It's like, that's Ugh. another, that's another level. It like, hurts to a different core versus that's why I'm like a first date. It's like, it sucks. Sure. No, yeah. It would be nice if they told you, but like, it's not owed to you. That's the thing. It's entitlement. It's mm. not owed to you. I don't owe you an explanation. I don't. If I went on a date with you and you text me after saying I had fun and I just hearted it, I don't owe you a like, by the way, I don't want to see you again. <sighs> it's just, okay, well, I'm glad you had a good time. I'm going to move on with my life. I might date other people. If I don't message you fine above, that's why I'm like, just a first meet mm-hmm. above that. That's when I think it starts to get into a gray area of like, just fucking say it, you know, just text somebody and be like, Hey, this isn't a connection I want to pursue. I wish you all the best. I do think that's awful. Yeah. To like not say anything, even but, after our first day, I don't know. That's- I've personally, I've definitely have said it, but there have been guys that lose their marbles on me. And you're just like, dude, I don't owe you this. Like, yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people in general that do like you'd yeah. be shocked. I've gotten it. I get screenshots from some of the clients that I have where of like, whoa, you went on one date with this girl and told her, and like the text was just like, hey, I think you're lovely. I just don't, and it's a fucking dissertation of like, you lied to me. You said you wanted to relate. And it's like, whoa, you were way more invested in this than that person was because you yeah. spent two hours with this person. Yeah. That's where it just gets a little dicey. That's why I'm like, listen, I'm not saying to do it. I'm not saying everybody go out and not answer. It's just, if it happens, it's like, then don't go running around being like, I keep getting ghosted because it's like, what happens when you get ghosted? You start to say, what's wrong with me? Am mm-hmm. I not good enough? You start to internalize it versus yeah. I had a date and I just, the guy didn't want to hang, he didn't want a second date. That's yeah. it. Just like, don't create a narrative is my point. It's the emphasis that we put on it. Exactly. And we're letting down, like it's the expectations. Exactly. The what ifs. Yeah. That's oh. more my issue. And it's the same with the texting. When people are like, oh, you're against it. I'm like, no, if you can handle it, do whatever you want. Yeah. But then I'm the one getting the messages after where you're having a full on panic attack because you feel like you're being abandoned when you literally never met this person. That's where I have to say, okay, well then you can't handle this. So let's take it away. Yeah. Right. So right. it's like, if you're secure and you go and if somebody isn't in and you're like, well, whatever, he goes to me. Okay, move on with my life. Yeah. But if you internalize it, that's when I'm like, let's change the verbiage. What do you what like what would be the biggest thing that you see in your coaching? Communication. Just being able to be honest and like or you know, and I like I think the men are very confused. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of my guy clients that are like, I don't know what to do. One TikTok is telling me a woman should make the move. The other one's telling me a guy should. I don't know what to do. Do I want to respect her? But then I'm going to get canceled. And it's like, they're very confused. And so they're acting, but then the girl doesn't want, but then this, and it's like, meh. And then on the women's side, there's this fear of putting themselves out there, of being like, hey, I really like you. I had a great time. I'd love to see you again. Just this, re- just this fear of rejection. And it's like, I get it. Nobody likes to be told, hey, I'm not feeling it. Mm-hmm but I'd rather you just tell me versus me pretending and hiding and then staring at my phone for three days and wondering if you're going to contact me. It's like, I'd rather just get an answer. Yeah. And so I think there's like a fear with most of the people that I work with that, that we work through of like, 
empowering them of like, hey, it's okay to have a voice. And hey, here, let me teach you how you can support yourself in these moments. And it's okay that this guy didn't text you for 24 hours. Like that doesn't mean that you should write him off. Mm -hmm. Just means that maybe like you can talk to him about like, hey, I'd love more communication in between our dates. It's scary because you're like letting your walls down. And then it's like, you'd rather be like, yeah, fuck, I already knew that was going to be like, of course, because shitty. See, and that's that self protection part. And then Ooh. we become the f- self fulfilling prophecy. And it's prophecy. so hard. It is so hard to shake. Sneaky little bitch. Like, she's not on your side. She's not on your side. And we keep her around and she just sabotages the shit out of things. Actually, I'll reframe that. She is on your side. She's trying to protect you. That is true. That's it. That's self sabotage has got, it's like, because sabotage implies you're doing that on purpose to hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't think you're doing that on purpose cognitively to be like, I'm going to hurt myself today, but you're protecting yourself. Yeah. When we go to the deeper root, well, yeah, when I was a kid, I was abandoned a lot. So this scares me. Okay, I get it. Yeah. I can hold space and compassion, but is it an explanation or an excuse? Yeah. That's all. But we have to reframe that because self protection is like, oh, okay, I'm trying to protect myself. What am I trying to protect myself from? Then we can start to, oh, I'm scared of being rejected. Okay, well, no risk, no reward. If I don't invest into something, yeah, I may mm-hmm. lose it, but then I also may gain it. Yeah. And so we kind of have to have that like, what do I have to lose type attitude? Because it's like, yeah, if you go slow and you take your time to get to know somebody and not love bomb and not force everything through a, a square through a circle hole, like love bombing terrifies me. Fucking terrifying. It terrifies me. It's so scary. And I think some people are like, oh my gosh, like the roses on the first date. That would be number one sign. I'm like, I'm being love bombed right now. 100%. And it would like, freak me out. Or they're like, they call me all the time. Like one of my clients, she has a guy, she's like, he calls me way too much. He texts me all the time. He wants me to meet his mom. We've had one date. And I'm like, that's love bombing. Because yeah. what they're doing is an inorganic, the pinch has to match the ouch. It's an inorganic amount of love, attention, and affection when you don't know this person. Right. So it's like, cut the shit. You do not know this person. No, you do not need to meet their parents. No, you do not need to know. <laughs> I had one person write in that within a month, they both went traveling to each other's homes, met each other's family, went and did it. And then of course she was like, and then after a month, he said he didn't want to be with me. And I'm like, because he was chasing a feeling he was not chasing you. People that love bomb are for two reasons. To mm-hmm. seek safety because they're really anxious and they want to know you're not going to leave me. Mm-hmm. But then when that dust wears off and they're like, oh, I have you. Oh, well, no, I didn't actually want exciting. that. I yeah. just wanted the cha- I wanted to feel safe. Or they're narcissistic and they're doing that to manipulate you because when they love bomb you and they become, oh my God, look, you become, the, you let your boundaries down. You be, They become the center of your universe. Mm-hmm. And then that's when they can start the next phase, which is the devaluation phase. Because they go in and they're charming and they're amazing. And then once they have you, then they start to devalue you mm-hmm. because that's the manipulation and the abuse. Because imagine if I was always so lovely to you and then I came to you one day and was like, yeah, well, that sweater would look better if you lost maybe 10 pounds. And <laughs> yeah. then you're like, oh, well, you must love me, right? You care about me, so yeah. you're trying to protect me. That's the abuse. And then they start to devalue you. Well, you'd be more useful if you actually did this. And you're like, but just yesterday you were telling me that you loved me and I was amazing. That's how they do it. Mm-hmm. They come on strong. We have to put boundaries. Hey, I don't really know you very well. I'd love to just go a little bit slower and just get to know you. Please don't buy me any more gifts. I appreciate it, though. Yeah, but do you think you can fix that? Because- I don't know if I would want to say something to somebody if I see the love bombing. Totally. Well, I think it's one of those things. Oh yeah. For me, if it's like that overt love bombing, just take that as a sign. But if it's something where it's like, maybe you see it's more anxiety driven, it's okay to be like, Hey, Mm. just trying to get to know you. We have to look at as mom. If it's too well rehearsed, that's when it's more manipulative. When it comes from that place of where you're like, oh, you just want to like, like the guy that was saying to my client who's just messaging her all the time, that doesn't sound, it's not manipulation. He's just really like wants to feel safe and to, oh, I want I have you, I have you. It's like, there's probably a mother wound there and that's fine. Yeah. That's where it's like, but I'm with you. I think if you even have to say it. <laughs> it's like, no. I think it's already at that point, it's too far gone. But I think a lot of people do find love bombing endearing. Very. Until you've like really experienced it. And then you're like, oh, Fuck no. And well, what's, what bums me out is a lot of people that have experienced love bombing, then they experience it and then they get hurt and then they're still not learning from it. Mm. And it's just, oh, well, you know, because guys lie. And it's like, that's not it, dude. This person was chasing a feeling. They're not chasing you. And right. that's why they can ghost. That's why they bolt. That's why they leave because it was, they don't want to deal with the confrontation. They don't want to deal with your emotions because it's not going to make them feel good. Yeah. Because they're chasing a feeling. It feels good. That's why when people are like the chase, I'm like, what are you engaging in a chase? Eventually someone has to stop running. Right. Eventually you have to meet. And then if this person's getting their high because you're unattainable and then you become available, what do you think they're going to, they're not going to, ah, I'm good. I know. Like once a love bomber does have you, completely disinterested. It's very fairy tale, right? It's like, oh, a Disney prince. Oh, and it's like, 
Disney lied to you. Like, there is no prince that's coming to get you. Yeah. Like, I have a really good friend. Not really good friend. I have a good friend. And she creates a lot of content of like, I have the perfect this and the perfect that. And it's like, listen, yeah, you you got a rich husband who takes care of you. You don't have to do anything. And it's like, but don't worry. He has his issues too. Like, Mm -hmm. ain't nothing free. Because you know why? He takes care of everything. She doesn't. And she has like a couple of dollars on her own. I asked her to go to lunch. And her response was, oh, I... I didn't ask him if I could, and I don't normally go without him. Oh, not the asking. And I was like, I used to have a friend like that too. I'm like, ask who? Yeah, and I was like, oh, I, and I was like, but I'm gonna come get you for lunch. Like, what's? And she was like, yeah, he just doesn't feel comfortable with me going out without him. And I was like, so this is the price you pay because nothing's free, right? So right, sure, right, he right. pays for everything, but he owns you. I have a client like that. She's 20 years into a marriage, and she doesn't know how to get out because she's no money. He takes care, and he's abusive. He's alcoholic, and it's like, listen, I get it. We want the provider mentality, mm-hmm, the sprinkle, sprinkle. Don't worry, baby, ain't free. You get, you're gonna pay that price. I've watched it. My own mother. I've yeah. watched how many women that we've seen. I'm not saying, of course, to have somebody that wants to take care of you as a human, but I don't need you to financially. I don't. You're not my father, and I don't need to be a burden to you, and you don't need to pay for my eyelashes and my hair and all that. Like, babe, I can take care of myself mm-hmm. because I want to be able to have that choice to take care of myself if I need to. Yeah, you can provide for me in other ways, emotionally, physically. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't mean that monetary, like financially. I know you have to. I, th- I bring. I'm the breadwinner in my home. My partner works for my company. He earns his own money, mm-hmm. but like. The roles are reversed a little bit here, but we both have, we have separate bank accounts. We have our own money. And we've had conversations many a times where I'm like, if we break up, like I'll just move on with my life and you will too. Yeah. It doesn't mean I don't love you, but we have very real conversations quite often. I'm like, is this it? Like, is this it? Are we at an impasse? And he's like, no, I think we can work through this. And I'm like, okay, let's talk. Because yeah. if he told me, I, I'm sorry, but I, this is an impasse. I'd be like, okay. Okay. Yeah. We have to be okay to lose people. Mm. you have to be okay. You're going to lose people. Death is one thing I can guarantee for every one of us. Mm-hmm. Breath and life, breath and death. That's it. You, you're going to breathe and then you're going to die. That's a guarantee. Yeah. So we have to be okay. And if you're not, and you tell your nervous system, I'm only safe if I have this person, welcome to dysregulation. You'll always be feeling unsafe. Dude, there's 9 billion people on the planet. You don't think right. I can find somebody else? You right. think there's only one? And it's like, eh, well, go watch the twin flame documentary and let me know if you think that's real still. Yeah. And it's just like, and listen, you want to believe in your astrology. You could believe in whatever you want. I don't care. But that can't be, well, you know, your sign doesn't match with mine. So then we must not be, or we're meant to be because of that. And it's like, no, you will find other, my mom always said, you're good before them. You'll be great after. Mm-hmm. Oh and yeah. You, uh, post breakup. Blah, blah, blah. And with the way, the amount of people would sad will write in and be like, but I wasn't good before. I'm like, then what makes you think during you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to come correct. If you want a solid relationship, you really do have to come correct and be so fucking for real with yourself. Like look at yourself in the mirror and be like, let's kick this shit. Let's kick the attachments and like, or not the attachments, the anxious attachments. And like, obviously they still boil up. You don't really- No, you never get rid of your anxiety. Get rid of those. Yeah. I'm still- I feel like anxiety is kind of like just- You're human. Like how you're sad, you're happy, anxious. I feel like everyone, if you don't have anxiety, you have a pulse. The difference is it's the attachment, right? And Mm -hmm. it's like you said, I want to connect. I don't want to attach. Yeah. Because attaching means- (laughs) Oh, oh, that's a childhood thing. No, no, no. I want to connect with you. And then we choose together to create this relationship. Right. I am very securely attached with my partner because I know that I'm okay with him and I'm okay without him. I don't need him to validate me every five seconds. I don't need, I don't fear that he's going to leave me because at the end of the day, I will be okay by myself. And that's the thing is like, my mom used to say this one thing when I'd be like, oh, you know, another like, I remember it was like Christmas and I was like, oh, you know, I'm just going to like stay home and order Chinese food and like kind of just hang out. And I was like, I'm just bummed. And my mom laughed and she was like, this could be the last time you do this. Mm. You might want to enjoy that. She was like, because one day you'll have a dude in your house and blah, blah, blah. And she was right. That was the last Christmas I spent alone. And now every year I'm like, shit, you know, you're like, fuck, I really would kill to just be alone right now and like walk around my house naked and just be in my own thoughts. Well, you can't. Now you have a partner. Right. So we need to fall in love with the life that you're in right now, because this could be the last time that you're single and alone. So fucking enjoy it. Enjoy it. Embrace it. Some of my best times were in my little studio apartment in like the Valley, just living my best life. Like you really do have to take those moments and be like, this isn't bad. Like you're not like even the dates that you think are like shit, you're going to look back and be like, thank God I went through all that. Like what your mom said. That's so true. I remember like after one of my last breakups, I moved back home with my mom for a few months. I'm like, this is so fucking rough. But then I'm like, this is also so beautiful because I don't think I'll ever be able to be in the same house with her again, having our wine nights and like making charcuterie boards. I'm like, I'm, that was such a low point, but I'm like, that was also such a beautiful point. So people really do need to just realize these single times when you live alone, 
you're roughing it out. Like these are some of the best times that you really can have. And it's totally okay to acknowledge you're frustrated. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. It's totally okay. Like one of my clients, she was like, God damn it. Like I'm just, I'm tired of being alone and like bringing the groceries. And I'm like, I get it. Mm-hmm. Totally get it. I remember how many times you get a package and you're like, God damn it. I wish I just had a dude here that could help me. Taking this out up. the trash. Like fuck. But it's like, but that's okay to acknowledge that like you're allowed, we can hold two conflicting truths. Of and course. that's a huge part. That's a good point. Yeah. Huge part of growth is being able to hold two conflicting truths. I can still love the fact that I'm single and I can also be frustrated that I don't have a partner. Mm-hmm. You can have that of I'm okay being alone. And if I don't meet somebody, that's okay. But I really would like to. Mm-hmm. That's a okay. It's the same when we look at our trauma. You don't have to look at your parents and be like, they're good or bad. That's black and white thinking. Yes. If we have the extremities, you can look and say, My parents did the best they could with the information they knew, but they also were not able to attune to my needs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is a huge area of opportunity for anybody listening to get rid of that black and white thinking and to start holding space for very conflicting thought. I can love somebody and also know they're not good for me. People think it's the pendulum swing. I have to either miss you or never want to see you again. Mm -hmm. Black and white thinking. It's a very, it's actually a cognitive distortion that anxious people have predominantly because it's trauma. And we're very, nope, it's this or it's this. And we don't have that capacity to see that other shade in the middle. And that's my goal is to help people see that part and that perspective shift. Sure, you might think that every guy needs to text you. My partner didn't. Mm -hmm. So there you go. There's one man on this planet that disagrees (laughs) with your statement. I forgot we were playing a game. Okay, are we ready? I'm so ready. Put me in the game, coach. Yes, girl. Okay. Never have I ever given advice I would never take. Mm, of course I have. Uh, who am I trying <laughs> to get? Like, He's I, so fucking for real. Yeah, I was like, well, I'd like to say recently, no. I, the, t- I, 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 I say what I mean. I mean what I say. Like mm-hmm. as you could, you know me, on camera, off camera, it's the same fucking person. Yeah. Um, but I think in the past, absolutely, I, I would give advice of like, you should leave. And I'm like, I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I want to do that. No, I'm not doing that. No, but you should. Never have I ever used social media to make an ex jealous. Mm-hmm. I know how to thirst trap. Oh, oh! she knows exactly what angle to pop the butt. Oh yeah, no, I have. And it's worked. <laughs> oh, of course. Sometimes, like, I don't want to be like, men are so stupid, but like, no, but in this scenario, it's like, we know you're visual creatures. We know exactly what to do to yeah. get the engagement we need. 100%. I'm, I know what to do to get that flame emoji on my story. And don't you worry. There it is. Mm-hmm. Like clockwork. It's like, man, hump line and sinker. Three, two, one. Thank you. Nick, thank you for being consistent right on time. <laughs> At least you're consistent in some aspect. Like aspect. Never have I ever posted a long caption on a relationship post. Ah, there have been like a little lengthy, but it's you. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually me talking about, because like I remember my friend years ago, she's a producer and I was posting stuff and she was like, all right, here's a challenge. Only make a caption that actually has something to say. And I was like, okay. And so I only posted things when I had something to say and not Mm. just like cloudy day, you know, and you're like, that's not doing anything. And so I became in that mindset of when I post something, it has something to say. So like when I posted about my, like my one year anniversary, it was like more vulnerable of like, I never thought I was going to meet someone like this. And I was that girl that had really shitty dates, but like this human exists. Yeah. So yeah, I've done it. How do you feel about like people posting about their significant others? When it's too often, I'm trying to like ask, who are you trying to convince me or you? Because that's the thing. I, my ex, when I was in my really unhealthy narcissistic relationship and I was like, no kid, 30 pounds lighter than I am now. Like I was to the point where people were asking like, hey, are you okay? Yeah. It was pretty bad. Um, we were Instagram couple of the year. No one had any idea that we were miserable oh. because every post was how much we loved each other and all that. Meanwhile, I'm crying on the floor and he's walking out on me for the 15th time that week. Fuck. So I try to actually stay off of it. I barely post about me and Ryan mm-hmm. because it's like, unless we're literally doing something, well, that's the thing, as vulnerable as I am, people think they know this whole spectrum of me. And I'm like, no, 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 you know what I tell you. Mm-hmm. You know what I want you to know. You don't yeah. actually know, I mean, to a certain extent, but I'm like, you don't really know what's behind closed doors. I tell you honestly, but I'm going to still keep quite a bit in my pocket because you don't need to fucking know what's going yeah. on. Yeah, moving along. Okay, never have I ever broke up with someone I was still in love with. No, I haven't. I've, de- I've broken up with people that I loved, but I wasn't in love with them any further. Mm, and that's very different. Yeah. yeah. Never have I ever stayed friends with an ex. I did for like, I did for a couple of months and then we, and it wasn't not, but it was a mutual breakup. Like I kind of looked at him one night and I was like, this is, it was the person I broke up with that I loved, but I was like, this isn't working. And he kind of looked, he's like, I agree. Like we tried, we had dated for like a year and we both kind of were like, eh, this is fun. But like, I don't think that we're going to be long term. And we like stayed friends for like a couple of months after because we genuinely cared about each other. Right. And then I moved on, met somebody and he moved on and we just kind of left it off. But like, I haven't stayed friends 
I don't believe in staying friends with an ex if either one of you has emotions. St- I just don't. I, I think it's like you're just kidding yourself. You're just kidding yourself and somebody is going to get severely hurt. We'll stay in touch. It's like, no, no, no. You really do have to do the no contact and just cut it cold turkey. 21 days. That's the withdrawal. That's I'm actually my friend, Britt Frank. She's a neuropsychotherapist and we're doing a course together and like we're doing a breakup thing. 21 days scientifically is what it takes to kick a hat, to kick an addiction. Humans are addictions because you're, do- you're waiting. That dopamine receptor is, is yeah. being depleted because you're used to having them yeah. and the serotonin. And so you have to replace that. And it takes you 21 days to be able to withdraw from them and start to replace that with other things. Never have I ever stayed in a toxic relationship because I thought I could change them. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> She certainly has. Uh, my ex, I, I really believed that I could change this person by just being better, by just being the person that they needed me to be. Mm -hmm. And then what I realized was people change for themselves, not for other people. uh, Because if I could just change somebody, well, then I would have changed everybody with my content by now. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because when I use that example, people are like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. If you are betting on potential, then you are betting on shit that you're going to lose your fucking money. Accept people as they are and stop trying to change people. People can grow, people can evolve, but they're not going to drastically change just because you exist. Now that is fucking entitlement. That's yeah. why I hate if he wanted to, he would. Because it's mm. a statement that doesn't understand human capacity. So if I came to you and was like, well, you must not want to be anxious then. You must not want it bad enough. And you'd look at me and be like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like I had trauma. I had things that caused this. Yeah. No, I understand if where you're like, well, if he wanted to call me, he would. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe that person's just not jiving with you. But what I find that statement, it releases any accountability. Well, he must not want it enough. It's like, or maybe you're a fucking cunt to this person. Mm. Maybe you're a tyrant. Maybe you're overbearing and this person doesn't need to change who they are. And maybe actually you do. And so I find it to be a cop-out because it doesn't understand human psychology. It goes well, and every therapist is coming out saying this now. So it's like, come after me if you want. But like <laughs> your clickbait bullshit, if it yeah. fits on a bumper sticker, it ain't real life. Yeah. And so if he wanted to, he would. If he wanted to change, he would. And it's like, oh yeah, oh, because you're doing that, right? Right. Because it's so easy for you to do that. Yeah. But yet you expect other people to. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds like a parent thing, right? I wanted my dad to change and he didn't. Yeah. But yet I'm expecting you to? Nah. So yeah. I just think we need to be a little bit more realistic and and get rid of bumper sticker slogans that don't actually help you. Because yeah. it's like when a girl says, well, if he wanted to, he would. I'm like, how's that helping you? Yeah. Like, how's that, what is that doing for your life besides making you feel worse? Well, he must not want me bad enough. Right, right. Well, what's wrong with me? Thank you. Then exactly we start that. going yeah, into that narrative. Down the spiral. But again, might not have anything to do with want. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's that person doesn't actually like you. So right. <laughs> that's what I mean. But it releases control. It makes you not take any accountability. I try to not create narratives around things. And I'll just be like, what are the facts that I have? This person didn't ask me out again. That's it. That's the only fact I have is that this person did not ask me out again. I don't know why. I don't know the reasoning. I don't know if it's because of this, because of this. It could have been this. I'm not going to create that narrative and make this about me. One of the f- the four agreements that I love in the book, the four agreements is don't take things so personally. Mm-hmm. Because let me tell you, you are an extra in everyone else's movie, but yet you think you're a main character. You ain't shit to most people. Yeah. Half the people that I interact with, like these trolls, you think I remember their fucking name? I'm a huge part of their movie, apparently, because they have to make it known. You're an, a blip on my screen. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to be a dick. I'm just saying you don't hold a lot of weight into other people's lives. You're going to come in and out. I don't remember 90% of the people I've dated in the last 15 years. I don't fucking remember. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like I blocked them out. Yeah, because it's like, because you're just, you played a small part. You were not min- instrumental enough to take right, up right, a space right. in my life. So that's what we have to accept that like, if somebody doesn't want, very rarely does it usually have to do with you. It's usually yeah, It's never stuff. personal. Ever personal. No. But we, we do take it. We take it personal. It's a human thing, but that's my reminder to be like, let's try not to. <laughs> We are going to close it on that, but what would you say the best piece of advice that you can give somebody that's dating or just in the scene trying to figure it out? What would be the best advice you can give? Remember that you have power in things and remember that you have a choice. It's not just about if they're going to choose you, you also get to choose if you choose them, but more importantly, do you choose yourself? And I think we have to really take some fucking time, put a speed bump, take a minute, drop your phone and just be for a second. Allow yourself to feel, to process, to acknowledge, to validate, and stop gaslighting yourself. Stop discrediting yourself and start allowing yourself to take up space because your voice matters and we want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, Sabrina, this has been a therapy session in its own (laughs) for me and I'm sure it'll be for the viewers. Thank you so much for being on After Curfew. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. (laughs) 